Thank you. Distinguished participants of the plenary session, ladies, gentlemen, friends, I've had a look at the discussions that have taken place over these days here at Valdai, very interesting, very substantive. I do hope that you do not regret coming to Russia. You have a chance to talk to one another. I'm very glad to see all of you. The Valdai Club gives us a forum to talk about tectonic shifts that are underway or that have already occurred in the world. We've spoken on many occasions about the risks associated with the decline of world institutions, the erosion of collective security principles, and the substitution of international law for the so-called rules. I wanted to say, you know who came up with those, but no one knows who came up with these rules, what underlies these rules, what's inside those rules. I think there is an attempt to introduce just one rule for the powers that be, the global powers that be, should have a chance to do whatever they please and be, you know, uh, able to do whatever without any punishment with impunity. The value of the Valdai discussions consists in the fact that different assessments and forecasts are expressed here. And as to their accuracy, life itself has confirmed them with certainty, because the most rigorous and unbiased examiner is life. It shows how accurate our discussions in the previous years have been. Alas, the developments are following the negative scenario so far, and we spoke about this negative scenario on multiple occasions during previous meetings. Moreover, these developments have turned into a large-scale systemic crisis, not just military, political, but also economic and humanitarian. The so-called West, as it were, because there is no unity, we understand that this is a very complex conglomerate, but be that as it may, let's call it the West. Over the recent years, and especially over the last months, has taken several steps towards escalation. And they're always trying to escalate. There's nothing new in that. They're fueling the war in Ukraine, organizing provocations around Taiwan, destabilizing the world, food and energy markets. As far as the last one is concerned, it was not deliberate. We do not doubt that. It was due to a number of systemic errors con committed by the Western authorities I've just mentioned. And as we can see, it's all been compounded by the destruction of European gas pipelines. This is incredible, but this is, however, something we're witnessing, these tragic events. Dominion of the world is precisely what the so-called West has decided to stake in this game. But this game is a dangerous, dirty, and deadly one contests the sovereignty of peoples and nations, their identity and uniqueness, and has no regard whatsoever for the interests of other countries. Well, we cannot say rejection directly, but this is basically what we see happening in life. And those who formulate these rules believe that others have no right to their unique path. Everyone needs to abide by these rules. And I would like to remind you of Russia's proposal addressed to our Western partners. The proposal to reinforce, trust, and build a system of collective security last December. Yet again, this proposal was cast aside. But in the modern world, it's not going to be possible to sit this one out. Whoever sows the wind will reap the whirlwind. The crisis has taken on a truly global magnitude. It affects everyone, and we should not entertain any illusions as to that. Humanity is essentially faced with two options. Either we continue accumulating the burden of problems that is certain to crush all of us, or we can work together to find solutions, functional if imperfect ones, solutions capable of rendering our world more stable and safer. You know, I've always believed and the power of common sense, and I still do. And that is why I'm convinced that sooner or later, both the new centers of the multipolar world and the West will have to embark upon an equal dialogue about our shared future. And the sooner that happens, the better, naturally. 
And in that regard, I would like to share with you some emphases which we find very important. The developments of today have relegated to the background environmental issues. As surprising as that may be, this is something I'd like to start with. And climate change is no longer in the headlines, but far from disappearing, these fundamental challenges are only growing worse. One of the most dangerous consequences of the environmental imbalance is a reduction in natural biological diversity. And right now I'd like to move to the topic we've all gathered for. Is other kind of diversity any less important? I refer to cultural, social, political, and civilizational diversity. At the same time, simplification, erasure of all differences, well, this is all but the essence of the modern world. But what is behind this simplification? First and foremost, it's the depletion of the West's creative potential and its desire to contain and to inhibit free development of other civilizations. There's also a direct self-serving interest hiding there. By imposing their values, consumer models, they seek to standardize these models. Our opponents, let me put it mildly, are trying to expand their markets for their products. So, you know, it's all very simple. And it's no coincidence that the West says that it's its culture and its world view that should be recognized as universal. They are not saying that outright, but this is how they behave. And they insist through their policies on everyone accepting these values unconditionally. Let me quote from Alexander Solzhenitsyn's famous Harvard address. Back in 1978, he said that the West, let me quote, has a blindness of superiority that continues. And this is what happens. Upholds the belief that the vast regions everywhere on our planet should develop and mature to the level of present-day Western systems. It was back in 1978. Nothing has changed since then. Over the last 50 years or so, this blindness Solzhenitsyn spoke of, by its nature, it's racist and neo-colonial, and it has taken on an unsightly form once the so-called unipolar world was established. But what can I say in response? Belief in one's own infallibility is a dangerous state because it's but one step away from a desire by those who deem themselves infallible to destroy, obliterate those they do not like, as they say, to cancel them. Let's think about the sense of this world, the mean of it, even at the height of the Cold War, when the confrontation of systems, ideologies, and military machines were opposition was in full swing. It never occurred to anyone to reject, deny the very existence of culture, art, and science of your opponent. Yes, there were several restrictions with regard to educational, scientific, cultural, and regrettably sports relations. But be that as it may, both Soviet and American leaders of those days had an understanding that humanitarian field is very delicate. You've got to study your opponent and have respect for him and sometimes even learn from him to preserve a foundation for healthy, constructive relations for the future. But what is happening now? Back in their days, Nazis went as far as to burn books. Right now, the Western champions of liberalism and progress have slipped into banning Dostoevsky and Tchaikovsky. The so-called cancel culture is basically a cancellation of culture that annihilates everything that is alive and creative. It stunts the growth of free thought in economy, politics, and culture. The very liberal ideology itself has today changed beyond recognition. In the very beginning, classical liberalism interpreted the freedom of each and every person as the freedom to say what you want, do what you want. But in the 20th century, liberals started to proclaim that the so-called open society has enemies. Well, it turns out open society has enemies. And the freedom of these enemies could and should be restricted, if not abolished altogether. And right now, they've reached an absurd situation when any alternative point of view 
is declared to be a subversive propaganda and a threat to democracy. Whatever comes from Russia, well, it's all the Kremlin's doing, but they should look at themselves first. Our, are we all powerful? If we see any criticism with regard to our opponents, why is it seen as the Kremlin's doing? They should, you know, think harder. They have to present more conceptually their point of view. They cannot simply shift the blame on the Kremlin's intrigues. And all of these was prophetically described back in the 19th century by Fyodor Dostoevsky, one of the characters of his novel, The Possessed. Shigalov, an nihilist, describes the bright future he devised. I quote, starting from unlimited freedom, I arrive at unlimited despotism. Our Western partners have arrived precisely at this point, and it's echoed by another character of the novel, Pyotr Verkovensky, who says that what we need is uh, universal betrayal, spying, and snitching. He says that society does not need talents nor superior capabilities. He says Cicero will have its tongue cut out, Copernicus will have his eyes put out, Shakespeare will be stoned, and this is what our Western opponents have come to. What is it if not the current Western cancel culture? because it was a great thinker, you know. And I'm truly thankful to my assistants who have found these quotes. What can I say in response? History will set everything right. And it's not going to cancel the greatest universally recognized geniuses of the world culture. It's going to cancel those who presently have decided that they can do with the world culture as they please for some reason. And as they say, these people have an incredibly high opinion of themselves, but several years will pass and no one will remember their names, but everyone will remember Dostoevsky and Tchaikovsky and Pushkin, whatever anyone says. Standardization, financial, technological, monopoly, erasure of all and every difference, this has been the foundation of the Western globalizational model whose nature is neo-colonial, basically. And the task was clear, to reinforce absolute dominion of the Western, the world economy, and the world politics, to put to service natural, financial, intellectual, human, and economic capabilities of the whole planet, doing that under the guise of the so-called new global interdependence. Let me recall yet another Russian philosopher here, Alexander Zinoviev. We are going to celebrate his centenary in a couple of days on October the 29th. More than 20 years ago, he said that for the Western civilization to survive at the level it had attained, it would need, I quote, all of the planet as its habitat. It would need all the resources of humanity, and this is what they laid their claim to. You know, it's so true. And in this system, the West enjoys an inherent, incredible advantage because it came up with the principles and mechanisms of this system. The principles, you know, everyone is talking about what are these principles? A black hole, no one understands. But once globalization started to benefit not Western countries, but other countries, I refer first and foremost to big nations of Asia the West either revisited many of the rules or even abolished some of them. And as far as the sacrosanct principles of free trade, economic openness and equal competition, even property are concerned, well, all of these principles were all of a sudden altogether forgotten. You know, when it was no longer beneficial, they decided to revisit the rules on the go. Yet another strawman argument and doublespeak. Western ideologues and politicians have long been telling the world there is no alternative to democracy. But in truth, what they meant was the Western, the so-called liberal democratic model, whereas all other variants and forms of democracy were rejected by them with disdain and arrogance. You know, it's been characteristic of them since the colonial times because they think that 
everyone, you know, uh, is just uh, substandard, whereas only they belong to the elite. But right now, the absolute majority of the world community demands democracy in world affairs. They reject authoritarian diktat of certain countries or groups of countries. What is it if not direct application of democratic principles in interstate affairs? But what is the position of the so-called civilized West? If you are Democrats, then I, one would think you would welcome this natural desire, aspiration towards freedom of billions of people. But it's not the case. The West calls that the sabotage of liberal world order based on rules, and it resorts to economic and trade war sanctions, boycotts, color revolutions, and it hatches and conducts different kinds of coup d'etat. And, you know, uh, they even say how much money they spend on the coup d'etat, the cheek of it. Well, uh, what about Suleimani, who was uh, taken out? You can think whatever you want about him, but uh, it's an official, a dignitary. He was killed in the third country. So what is it? Washington, as its, its tradition, calls the current world order a liberal world order. But day in, day out, this world order begets more and more chaos. And uh, it is becoming increasingly intolerant, even with regard to Western countries, should they attempt any kind of autonomy. And they even slap sanctions on their own allies unabashedly. And others uh, are simply, you know, sharing ob obeisance. Let's remember the July proposals of Hungarian parliamentarians who suggested that dedication to European Christian values and culture should be enshrined in a treaty on the European Union. But these attempts were seen not just as opposition, but hostile sabotage. You know, someone likes them, some others. But we in Russia, over thousands of years, have seen a peaceful coexistence of different religions. But we do not require that they should be changed, neither Christian values, nor Muslim values, nor other religious values. We have to treat one another with respect. And a number of regions, and I know that. I know that firsthand. People go together to celebrate Christian and Buddhist and uh, Muslim and Jewish uh, holidays. Well, I think it's worth speaking about at least. This testifies to the ideological crisis of the neoliberal model of the world order. In the American fashion, they have uh, no creative or positive agenda. They have nothing to offer to the world apart from retaining their domination. A true democracy in a multipolar world requires an opportunity for every nation, every society, every civilization to choose their own path, their own social and political system. And if the US and the EU enjoy this rule, then Asian countries, Muslim countries, the Gulf monarchies, and countries of other continents should have this right, and Russia too. And no one will ever be able to dictate to our nation what kinds of society and on what principles we should be building. A direct threat to the political, economic, and dialogical monopoly of the West consists in the fact that the world can see the emergence of alternative social models, which can turn out to be more efficient, more vibrant, more attractive than the ones that exist as of now. And these models will emerge and develop. This is inevitable. Incidentally, American political scientists, experts are writing on the subject directly, but the powers that be do not listen to them. But they can't help seeing that these ideas are being expressed and voiced on the pages of political science journals and in discussions. This development should be based upon a dialogue of civilizations with an emphasis on spiritual and moral values. Yes, different civilizations have a different understanding of a human being and his uh, nature. 
but it's only at the surface because all of them recognize the high most value and spiritual nature of a human being. And the foundation is of paramount importance. The foundation upon which our shared future is going to be built. I would like to point out the following. Traditional values are not a fixed set of principles everyone must abide by, far be it from it. The difference from the so-called liberal values consists in the fact that all of them are unique because they stem from a tradition of concrete society, its culture, and historical experience. This is why traditional values cannot be imposed on anyone. You need to simply have respect for them. Treat with care what has been devised ever centuries by each and every people, each and every nation. This is our understanding of traditional values. And this approach is shared and accepted by the majority of humanity. It's only natural because traditional societies of the East, Latin America, Africa, and Eurasia form the backbone of world civilization. Respect for the unique characteristics of nations and civilizations, this is in the interest of each and everyone because it even suits the interests of the West because it loses its superiority turning into a minority in the world arena. And of course, the right of this Western minority to its own unique culture, unique identity should be guaranteed unconditionally. We have to treat that with respect, but the same should apply to the rights of everyone else. If the Western elites believe that they can, you know, introduce into the society and the consciousness of the society, such bizarre trendy notions as dozens of genders or pride parades, well, let them do that. Let them do whatever they want. But they do not have the right to demand that others should follow in their footsteps. As we can see, Western countries are undergoing complex demographic, political, and social processes. It's their domestic affairs. Russia does not interfere within these affairs, nor is it going to, unlike the West, we're not getting into someone else's backyard. But we hope that pragmatism will emerge victorious, and the dialogue between Russia and the genuine traditional West, as well as other equal centers of development, all of that is going to be an important contribution to the construction of a multipolar world order. I would like to remind you that the multipolar world is the real, the only chance for Europe to rebuild its political and economic autonomy. Well, I'm not going to hide it. We understand, and even Europe says it. Right now, this uh, autonomy of Europe let me put it mildly, not to offend anyone. This uh, autonomy is very restricted. The world is diverse in its nature, and the attempts of the West to make everyone fit the mold are objectively doomed. Nothing will come of it. The overconfidence drive to global leadership and, in essence, to dictate or maintaining the leadership through dictate is, in reality, leading to the lower international standing of the U.S., including the U.S., it leads to growing mistrust to their capability to deal with anyone in general. One thing today, another thing tomorrow. You sign the document and then you tear it apart. There is no stability whatsoever in anything. How we can talk to them, sign documents? Can we rely on them? It's unclear. Before. Only some countries allowed themselves to argue with America, and that looked like almost scandalous. And now it's a routine thing when very different countries refuse Washington in its baseless demands, despite the fact that it still is trying to apply pressure to everyone. I think this is a very wrong policy. It's a road to nowhere. But let it be. It's their choice. I'm convinced that the people of the world would not disregard the, po the policy of intimidation that has discredited itself. And every time for the attempts to maintain its hegemony, the West will have to pay, and to pay a higher price each time. If I were uh, a Western elite, I would seriously think about this future 
just like today some political scientists and politicians are contemplating in the U.S. itself. In the current situation of harsh conflict, I'd like to say a matter of principle that Russia, being an independent and unique civilization, has never considered itself an enemy of the West. Americanophobia, Anglophobia, Francophobia, Germanophobia, uh, just the same kind of racism is as Russophobia and anti-Semitism, just like any other manifestation of xenophobia. We simply need to clearly understand, as I have said before, there are at least two types of West, maybe more. There is the West of traditional, primarily Christian values, freedom, patriotism, and rich culture, and now of Islamic values as well. The, a significant amount of population professes Islam. And this kind of West is close to us. We have common roots based in classical antiquity. But there is another kind of West, aggressive, cosmopolite, neocolonial, being a weapon of neoliberal elites. And Russia, naturally, will never make peace with the dictate of this kind of West. In 2000, after I was elected the president, I remember fully well, and I'll always remember this. I remember what price we've paid for annihilating the terrorist den in the Northern Caucasus when the West, that the West has uh, practically openly supported here. Grown up people here, and you know what I'm talking about here. We all know that was the fact of life. It was financial, political, and information support that was rendered. We've all lived through, through that. Moreover, the West did not only actively support terrorists on the territory of Russia, but it has largely nurtured this threat. We knew that. Nevertheless, after the situation has stabilized, when main terrorist groups were decisively defeated, thanks to the courage of the Chechen people as well, we've made the decision not to look back, not to hold grudges, but rather to move forward and to build relations, including with those who basically worked against us. We decided to build relations with everyone who wanted to do that, based on mutual benefit and respect to each other. We thought it was in our common interests. Thank God, Russia has survived through all the hardships of that time. We per persevered. We coped with domestic slash external terrorism. We maintained our economy, and it continued to grow. Our military capacity increased. We're trying to build relations with the leading countries of the West, with NATO as well. We had one message. Let's stop being an enemy to each other. Let's live in harmony. Let's build a dialogue, build trust, and therefore peace. In that, we were absolutely sincere. I'd like to highlight that. We understood clearly how complex such rapprochement would be. We still did it. But what we get in, did we get in return? In a nutshell, it was basically a no on all main di dimensions of possible cooperation. What we got in return is permanent pressure on us and creating hotbeds of tension at our borders. And if I may ask, what was the goal of that pressure? What was the goal? Just to practice? Well, of course not. The goal was to make Russia more vulnerable and to turn Russia into a tool of achieving their own geopolitical goals. That's it, that, that's a, the rule of the thumb. Everyone is turned into a tool and to use these tools to their own ends. And those who do not obey to, to, the, to this pressure, who doesn't want to be a tool, sanctions are introduced against them. Economic restrictions are introduced against them. Coup d'etats are being prepared and executed where possible, and so on. And in the end, if they do not succeed in anything, then the main goal is to eliminate, to wipe off the map. But that didn't work with Russia, and it will never happen. It will never be possible to implement this scenario. Russia does not challenge the elites of the West. Russia is simply standing up to its right to exist and to freely develop. 
we ourselves do not intend to become a new hegemon. Russia does not offer to substitute unipolarity, unipolar world with bipolar or tripolar world, domination of the West with domination of the East or North or South. That would uh, lead to yet another dead end. And I would like to quote the words of a great Russian philosopher, Nikolai Danilevsky, who believed, and I quote, that the progress is not everyone marching in the same direction as our opponents are trying to make us. But rather, well, the progress would would, would soon cease in that case, says Danilevsky. But the idea of the progress is to walk and explore the whole field of historically human domain in all directions. And he adds, not a singular not a single one civilization can be proud of presenting the apex of development. End of quote. I'm convinced that dictatorship can only be countered through the freedom of development of countries and nations, identity loss countered through the love to human being as a creator. The primitive simplification and bans can be countered through the flourishing complexity of cultures and tradition. The main idea of today's point in time is that all civilizations, states, and their integration associations indeed have opened all paths to pave their own democratic and original path. Primarily, we believe that the new world order should be based on law and justice. It should be free, fair, and unique. The, the world economy and trade should become more fair and open. Russia believes that it is unavoidable that the new international financial platforms will take shape, also for international payments. Such platforms should be outside of any national jurisdiction. They should be safe, depoliticized, automatic, and they should not depend on one single governance center. Is it possible? Yes. It would require a lot of effort and joining efforts of many countries, but it is possible. And that would rule out the possible abuse in new global financial infrastructure that would allow to effectively, beneficially, and safely and securely do without dollar and other so-called um, reserve currencies in international payments. The most so since uh, the West has discredited the Institute of International Reserves using dollar as, as a weapon. First, they were depreciated through inflation in dollar and eurozone, and later they have effectively pocketed our asset as assets snippety snap. Transition to payments in national currencies will gain momentum unavoidably. Naturally, that will depend on on the state of, uh, of the economies of the emitting countries and so on. But still, these payments will become predominant. That is the logic of sovereign economy and financial policy in the multipolar world. Moving on. Today, new centers for global development already possess unique technology and scientific developments in very diverse spheres. And in many dimensions, they can successfully compete with the Western transnational companies. It is apparent that we have common and rather pragmatic interest in an honest and open scientific and technological exchange. Together, everyone will benefit more than separately. The majority should benefit, but not, but not the separate ultra-rich corporations. What's, what's happening today? If the West is selling medicine or seeding material to other countries, then they give the order to kill off national pharmaceutical and selection industry. In reality, everything boils down to that. When the West procures machine tools and equipment, that, that wrecks local machine building. When I was the chairman of the government, I remember it was very simple. As soon as you open your market for a, a certain item, uh, goods, then the local producer is going down and it's almost impossible to bring back the industry. That's the way they build the relations. That's how they take over markets and resources. The countries are left without their technological and scientific potential. That, uh, that is not progress, that is enslavement, bringing down the economy to a primitive level. Technological development should not exacerbate global inequality, but rather decrease it. That is the tradition for 
Russian foreign policy and technology. For example, when we are building nuclear power plants in other countries, we simultaneously are creating their centers of excellence and nurture local talent. We create the whole industry. We don't just build one, one plant. We build the whole industry. And in essence, we give other countries an opportunity to make a real breakthrough in their scientific and technological development to bridge the inequality gap and to bring their energy to the new level of efficiency and environmental friendliness. I'd like to highlight once again, sovereignty and independent development does not mean isolation or autarky, but that, on the contrary, means active cooperation, mutually beneficial cooperation based on justice and equal rights. If if the liberal globalization brings about depersonalization and imposing the Western model on everyone around the world, then integration, on the contrary, is tapping into potential of each civilization in the interests of the whole for a common good. If globalism means dictate, dictate that what it boils down to, then integration is finding common strategies beneficial to everyone. In this regard, Russia believes necessary to more actively launch mechanism of creating larger spaces built on cooperation between neighboring countries whose economy, social system, resources, and infrastructure complement each other. Such large spaces, in essence, are the foundation for the multipolar world order, the economic foundation. The dialogue of such spaces gives birth to true unity of humankind, much more complex unique and multidimensional than in simplified versions of Western ideologists, well, some of them at least. The unity of humanity cannot be built according to the order, be like us, do like us. It is it's taken shape considera with consideration to the opinion of everyone, with careful treatment of identity of each community and nation. Only this principle can be the foundation for long-term cooperation in multipolar world. In this regard, maybe we should think about the structure of the United Nations, including its Security Council, how it should better reflect the multitude of global regions, because it is Asia, of Afri Africa, Latin America of tomorrow will be uh, defining much more than it is common, commonly thought today. And that is a positive thing. I'd like to remind you that the Western civilization is not the only one in our common Eurasian space. Moreover, the majority of the, of the population is situated in the east of Eurasia, which was the cradle of the ancient civilization of humanity. The value and significance of Eurasia is that this continent is a self-reliant self -reliant complex which has tremendous resources of all kinds and wonderful opportunities. The harder we work on greater interconnectedness in Eurasia, on creating new paths and forms of cooperation, the more tangible result we'll achieve. Successful activity of Eurasian economic unity, rapid growth of cloud and influence of Shanghai Cooperation Organization, large-scale initiatives in One Belt, One Road initiative, plans for multilateral cooperation on implementation of the transportation corridor north-south and many other projects in that part of the world, I'm sure um, bringing in the dawn of the new era, of the new stage in Eurasian development. Integration projects here do not compete but rather complement each other. Naturally, if they are implemented by the neighboring countries in their own interests and not introduced by external forces in order to drive a wedge in Eurasian space and to turn into a zone of block standoff. A natural part of the greater Eurasia could be its western tip of the continent, I mean Europe, but many of its leaders uh, are blinded by the convincement, by their idea that Europeans are better than others, that it's beneath them to cooperate in some endeavors as equals with others. And with this arrogance, they um, somehow did not notice that they've turned to be into uh, periphery to others, quite often into vassals without the right of vote. Colleagues, the collapse of the Soviet Union has destroyed the equilibrium of the geopolitical forces. The West has felt that it's uh, the winner and has proclaimed a unipolar world order where only its will, its culture, and its interests had the right to exist. Now this historical period of undivided domination of the West is coming to an end. 
is becoming the thing of the past. I mean, the unipolar world. We are facing a historic milestone. Ahead of us is possibly the most dangerous, unpredictable, and at the same time, crucial decade since the end of the Second World War. The West is, in, is incapable of unilaterally governing the humanity. However, it desperately tries to do that. The majority of the nation does, does not want to make peace with that. That is the main contradiction of the new era. The situation is rather revolutionary if we apply to, to the classics. Well, if, if we speak in, in the words of the classics, the, the elites do not want uh, the change, but uh, the, the poor do not, ca cannot live any longer with that. How to solve the issues of tomorrow is the main task for humanity. That is a painful and natural, though unavoidable, process. The future world order is being, sh is being shaped before our eyes. And in this case, we need to listen to everyone, to hear out every point of view, every nation, every society, culture, and religious ideas without imposing a single truth upon anyone. And only on the basis of that, understanding our responsibility for the destiny of the planet, we should build the symphony of human civilization. I think I, I, I would like to wrap up with that, and I would like to thank you for the patience that you have shown me listening to my statement. Thank you.